All right, well, let's go ahead and get out our Bibles. Turn your Bible on and uh, flip over with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, we're going to have our Bible study. If you're still filling out that Connect card, there's still a chance to turn it in. So after church, feel free to drop it in one of those receptacles on your way out, and uh, we'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you this week. Go ahead and get that listening guide out. We're going to fill in some blanks and, and take some notes together as, as we have our Bible study. And let me also just say, Man, I'm really, really looking forward to being with you on Good Friday. I hope that you're making time to be here for that. And it's going to be a lot of fun as we gather right here together and have one big Good Friday service. How many of you, let me just ask you, how many of you guys have ever asked God for a sign? Anybody ever asked for a sign before? Yeah, sure you have, right? We all have. Absolutely. And uh, sometimes we just need God to show up in a special kind of way. God, we need to hear from you. We're trying to make a big decision. God, what do you want me to do? Would you just show me a sign? Maybe you're getting deeper into a relationship and you're trying to figure out, is this the one? God, would you please show me a sign? Maybe you're trying to make a really big financial decision. God, is this the house you want us to buy? Is this the car you want us to buy? God, would you please just show me a sign? You're you're trying to figure out if this is the will of God. Some people have taken this line of thinking into an extreme view of what I call mystical, superstitious, religious gobbledygook. (laughs) And they start asking for these crazy signs. Lord, if this is really you, I'm looking at this orange tree. That orange is going to fall before I count to three. One, two, three. God, if this is from you, I just need a sign. I see all those birds on that power line. God, if this is from you, those birds are going to fly away in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7 and a half. You're just looking for a sign. You want to know, God, is this from you? Some people do what I call Bible roulette. And they'll take their Bible and they'll treat it like a magic eight ball and they'll shake it up and they'll say, God, I need a word. I just need a word. I need a word. And they'll open it up and God, whatever it says, that's what I'm going to do. And you'll just point anywhere like Bible roulette. Oh, okay. All right. Second Samuel chapter 24. Then David went and hid in a cave and relieved himself. Lord, is that what you want me to do? (laughs) Now, I don't fault these people because, you know, everybody's looking for a sign every now and then. I don't know if you guys remember this. Several years ago in Tampa, there was a building, and after landscapers removed the tree that had been there for years, the sprinklers had left a chemical residue. I think we got a picture of this building. And they saw in the stained glass what they thought was a picture of the Virgin Mary. And so hundreds of thousands of people traveled from all over the world to see the picture of the stained glass. In fact, some investors ended up buying the building, and on the second floor, they put a factory for making rosary beads that would go all over the world, and then they started having worship services right outside this building every single day. This went on for seven years until a troubled teenager and his high-powered slingshot (laughs) and a pocket full of ball bearings sent one of those ball bearings right between Mary's eyes (laughs) and shattered the glass. It's always the teenagers, you know? People are just looking for a sign. And as crazy as it may sound, you think, man, people really show up there worshiping at the stained glass window from the sprinklers? Yeah, well, that doesn't even compare to what happened down in Fort Lauderdale. There's There's a woman named Diana Dicer who lived in Fort Lauderdale. And after buying a loaf of white bread and Lando Lakes American cheese from Publix in 1994, she received a special visit. From who? The Virgin Mary, of course. Where did she appear? In her grilled cheese sandwich. (laughs) Diana carefully tucked away the grilled cheese sandwich into a plastic box nestled among cotton balls and saved it for a decade. This sounds like that McDonald's cheeseburger that's in the Smithsonian. Believing that this miracle should be shared with the world, she decided to put it on eBay. It got into a bidding war, and miraculously, since this sandwich didn't decay, it sold to the Golden Palace Casino for a whopping $28,000. 
And just when you think the story can't get any cheesier, (laughs) one year after receiving the $28,000 payment, she went back online and sold the frying pan that she made it in. And this was the official pan that made the grilled cheese sandwich. People are always desperate for a sign, looking for a sign. But you know, I can't blame them because I'm not superstitious, but like Michael Scott from The Office, I am a little stitious. And I've been asking God to give me a word for Easter Sunday. You know, sometimes pastors get what I call sermon writer's block. And I've been just asking God, what do you want me to share on Easter Sunday? We got thousands of people showing up here for church. I got to have a word from you. Lord, give me a sign. What should I actually talk about? God, I'm having writer's block. What should I talk about on Easter Sunday? And this week, God gave me a sign. You're not going to believe it. I'm sitting there having breakfast And I look down, and this is what I see right there in my breakfast. I mean, I just saw it clear as day. (laughs) And I just knew this is what I need to talk about on Easter. And then I looked down at my toast, and it was like resurrection Easter toast. I mean, right there in the middle of my breakfast, I just got a word from the Lord. It was a sign. Maybe I should just talk about the resurrection of Jesus. You guys think that would be a good message on Easter? Okay. Well, I got a sign from the Lord, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. P- people are always looking for signs. It's natural. God has hardwired us to look for him. There's something deep within us that is looking for him to show up. And in the first century, it was no different. And so Jesus was constantly giving signs to his followers. When Peter needed a sign, Jesus walked on water. I mean, talk about a sign. When the disciples needed a sign, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. This guy had been blind his entire life, and so Jesus gives him a sign. When the masses of people, the thousands that showed up needed a sign, Jesus took a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread out of some guy's lunchbox and fed thousands and thousands of people. Talk about a sign. But there was this one sign that got everyone's attention. I mean, it was the sign of all signs. It was a sign that brought the crowds. It was the sign of raising Lazarus from the dead. And when you read through the New Testament, you'll find that this sign is almost in a category all its own. It's in a class all its own. This sign was a dividing line that made people choose, is you is or is you ain't. It drew a line in the sand. Today is is Palm Sunday, and... This marks the official beginning of Holy Week, the triumphal entry. And for John, you can't talk about the triumphal entry. You can't talk about Palm Sunday without talking about Lazarus. Why? Because this was the reason for the crowds. Sure, they wanted to see the miracle man. Yeah, they wanted to meet Jesus. But you know what they really wanted to see? Dead man walking. Because they've heard about this sign. They knew he was dead for days, and now he's walking around, talking with people, eating as if he had never died. They want to see this man. They want to see Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a close, personal friend of Jesus. This is not some stranger off the street, not some geek off the street. He knew Lazarus personally. This is Martha's brother, Mary's friend. In fact, when news traveled to Jesus about the death of Lazarus, Jesus had an emotional response. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Some of you memorized this scripture. It's the shortest verse in all the New Testament. When Jesus heard that Lazarus died, Jesus, he wept. He had an emotional response because this was his friend. He knew Lazarus. Now, the healing of Lazarus happened just a few days before Passover. Now, I know sometimes when you read through the New Testament, you can get the timelines all mixed up and the people all mixed up, and you're wondering, is this New Testament? Oh, what's actually happening here? Let me me just remind you of the timeline. Jesus has been doing public ministry now for over three years. He's on his death march to the cross. This is happening days before the crucifixion, just like a week before the crucifixion. So he is on his way to the cross, And then all of a sudden, he hears that Lazarus is sick. The disciples come to him and say, Lord, Lazarus is sick. But Jesus remains cool as a cucumber. Hey, no problem, guys. In fact, Jesus says, don't worry. He's going to be just fine. And so the disciples immediately have a sigh of relief. Okay, 
because we've been with you for three years. We know if Jesus knows about it and he says everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be okay. So in, in the disciples' minds, they're thinking, okay, Jesus, it's time to pack up. We're going to go visit Lazarus. You're going to heal him just like all these other people you healed. So they start packing up all their things, packing up camp, getting ready to head towards Bethany. And they turn around and look, and Jesus is just sitting there. And they're probably thinking, Jesus, you said everything was going to be okay. It's time to pack up. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're not done here. We're going to stay here. In fact, Jesus doesn't just stay for a few minutes or a few hours. He stays there for a few days. And Lazarus gets so sick that he dies. Word comes to the disciples. In fact, Jesus himself says, friends, Lazarus has died. Oh. The disciples are dumbfounded. They, they can't believe he died. Jesus, you said everything would be all right. We trusted you. So the disciples then, they pack up everything and they start heading towards Bethany for a funeral. When they get there, everyone is crying. It's a horrible scene. By this time, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. This is, this is John's way of saying he's not just a little bit dead, he's really dead. He's been there four days. In fact, the King James Version says, he's so dead, he stinketh. Okay, I didn't even know that was a word, but... That's how it says it in the King James. Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem, and so everybody is heading to the capital city for Passover. Friends, family, aunts, uncles, distant relatives, all heading to Jerusalem. And so Bethany's right there by Jerusalem, so people are walking by, consoling Mary and Martha. I'm so sorry. We heard about Lazarus. And so Jesus does the same. He comes through, and he says, Hey, I'm so sorry about Lazarus. I even wept. And Martha, now I'm not quite sure, I'm using a little bit of my sanctified imagination, but Martha comes up and she says something like, Jesus, if you would have been here, you could have helped, you could have healed. Where were you, Jesus? Jesus has a response for Martha. He says, hey, hey, it's okay. Lazarus will rise one day. And she says, I know he'll rise in the resurrection. And she's trying to use all this spiritual language, you know, because she's a believer. I know he'll rise in the resurrection. And Jesus looks at Martha and says, don't you get it? I'm the resurrection. I'm here. The resurrection is not just an event. It's me. I'm the resurrection. Then Mary, sweet, tender Mary, anointing Jesus' feet, crying Mary comes up and she's just weeping and she says the same thing Martha says but she just says it in a more tender way Jesus if you would have been here if you would have only been here the text says that Jesus was greatly troubled in his spirit let me think about this the God who made the sun in a day greatly troubled in his spirit the God who walked on water greatly troubled in his spirit literally crying. Jesus wept. He wipes the tears from his eyes. He marches over to the tomb and he says, roll that stone away. And they start to roll the stone away and filled with passion for his father's will, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. You could have heard a pin drop. Everyone is waiting and watching, and everyone's jaw hit the ground when they see mummified Lazarus walking out of that tomb. This is the God who reverses rigor mortis. This is the God who took this dead, cold body and let blood start flowing through his veins. His synapses started firing all over again, and Lazarus comes out of that tomb alive. Shocked everyone. One scholar says the reason why ja Lazarus the reason why Jesus didn't just say, come forth, the reason why he called him by name is because if Jesus would have said, come forth, every grave in the world would have opened. There'd be dead people walking around everywhere. He called him by name, Lazarus, come forth. King of the universe, absolute power, speaking directly to his dead friend, Lazarus. Word traveled fast about this sign. Many of the Jews started to believe, and this upset the religious leaders, especially the Pharisees and the chief priests. Why? Well, because the chief priests were mostly Sadducees. This was a religious group of leaders who didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were Sadducee. I know, it's a corny joke. <laughs> Imagine 
If you don't believe in the resurrection and you've got hundreds and hundreds of followers who now don't believe in the resurrection and then all of a sudden you've got a guy who's been dead for four days, he's so dead he stinketh and he's walking by and he's high-fiving people and he's eating with the disciples and he's looking at the Sadducees and the Pharisees and giving them a, you know, a little thumbs up. Imagine what that does to your worldview. Because in one miracle, Jesus debunks their whole worldview. Now they have to believe in a resurrection. It's a miraculous sign. So on the Sabbath, a week before Passover, Jesus is at a dinner party in Bethany with Lazarus. And this is where we pick it up. If you have your Bible, John chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. It says this. And when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see who? Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Yeah, the crowds were there for Passover. Yeah, they wanted to see the miracle man. Yeah, they heard about all these miracles, but really, they wanted to see the walking dead guy. They want to see this guy, this sign, this guy that has been raised from the dead. They were looking for a sign, verse 10. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. I mean, picture the scene. Poor Lazarus, this poor guy can't catch a break. I mean, he's living. He knows Jesus. He knows Mary and Martha. He's probably seen some of the miracles firsthand. And then all of a sudden he gets sick. Jesus doesn't come and take away his illness, so he dies. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He goes directly to be in the presence of the Father. He's in heaven, no more sickness, no more pain, all things new. He's there with God. And then after being there for several days, he hears, uh, Lazarus, come forth. And he gets up and he comes back. Somehow his spirit is reconnected to his body. He comes up out of the grave and now he's alive. And he's walking with people, he's eating with people, he's high-fiving people, and then they want to kill him again. This poor guy can't catch a break. It's got to be hard to be Lazarus. Now, one day later, it's Palm Sunday in Jerusalem. These people want to kill Lazarus. They want to kill Jesus. And here's what happens. On the next day, verse 12, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Lazarus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Hosanna. Save us. It's literally what the word means. What did they want to be saved from? Roman oppression, heavy handed government, heavy taxation. These guys were just almost enslaving the Jews all over again. They expected Jesus to be this political king, like an Alexander the Great. They wanted him to come in on a Clydesdale. You know, the Rolls Royce of the first century. They wanted him to come in in a stately way, like a king, to usher in his kingship. Verse 14, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sit sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified... Then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he'd done this sign. That's why they're there. They're looking for the sign. What's the sign? Lazarus. They want to see the sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, that you are, getting, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The whole world has come out here to see Jesus. Jesus was like an unstoppable avalanche disrupting their worldview. The marching orders of a Roman soldier was called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. You protect the peace of Rome at all costs. Even if it means you have to snuff someone out, kill them, you protect the peace of Rome. Do not let one of these rebels come in and disrupt our worldview. But what are they going to do now? Because even if we put him to death, this guy has power over death. What in the world are we going to do with this guy? It disrupted all of their thinking, all of their worldview how in the world would they defeat a leader who has power over death? 
If you have your listening guide, let's go ahead and take a couple of notes. Let's see what we can learn from this Bible passage, especially about Palm Sunday. And number one, go ahead and write this down. The empty tomb is a sign for you. The empty tomb is a sign for you. You looking for a sign? Here's your sign. It's the empty tomb. These people, they needed a sign. They were under Roman oppression. They were praying for a deliverer. The empty tomb of Lazarus was a sign that Jesus, this Jesus, could be the one. He could be the Messiah, the deliverer that we've been waiting for. You see, they thought Jesus was going to come in and usher in a political reign, a political kingdom. They were looking at the wrong empty tomb. Jesus came in to usher in a new kind of kingdom. As New Testament believers, you can't unknow what you already know. The sign of Lazarus was simply a preview of things to come. It was the first empty tomb, but it wasn't the last. Just as Lazarus died, Jesus died. Just as Lazarus was raised, Jesus was raised. Only difference is after Lazarus was raised, he died again. After Jesus was raised, he never died again. He died once for all, never to die again. Lazarus never shows up again in the Bible. You notice that? I mean, he's not there after the resurrection of Jesus. He's not there on the road to Emmaus. He's not there at Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. He's not there throughout any of the book of Acts. You know why? Because they killed him. They killed him. Right around the time they killed Jesus, they killed Lazarus. He was gone. They killed him again. But the resurrection of Jesus is eternal, never to die again. He died once for all. The resurrection of Lazarus is a sign that points us to Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is a sign that points to you. You see, one day your body will rise, and you're probably thinking, yeah, I know, at the resurrection, you're probably trying to give a, a Martha spiritual response. Yeah, Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. He wants your body, this physical body that you've been given, will rise one day if you're a believer in Christ. Signs matter. You want to look at a sign? Look at the empty tomb. That's the sign that God's given for you. Many times I'll ask people how they found our church, and they'll tell me, oh, we saw the sign. We got these signs, and they're not trying to say something spiritual or mystical. They're literally saying there's a sign out front that says church. That's how they found us. When I moved from Florida to Kentucky, um, I got lost all the time. Florida's easy to navigate for me. I'm a Florida kid. I grew up in Florida. And the road systems here are pretty simple. You got ocean on one side, land on the other. So it's just on a grid, north, south, east, west, very, very simple. When I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, all their road systems were circles. You could be going north, and then next thing you know, you're going east. I mean, I don't even know how that happened. I get lost all the time. And there was this one place on I-64. And if you're heading east, if you miss this one sign, there's not another exit for 12 miles. And the only place to turn around is 12 miles down the road in this crummy little town called Simpsonville. I hated Simpsonville. <laughs> oh, now I'm sure the people from Simpsonville are nice people. I'm sure they're good people. No one ever wants to go to Simpsonville. The only reason you go to Simpsonville is to turn around because you missed the sign. People that are in Simpsonville thought they'd never go to Simpsonville. They didn't want to go to Simpsonville. They don't want to be in Simpsonville. But for whatever reason, they're stuck in Simpsonville. Some of you are stuck in what I call a spiritual Simpsonville. You're in a place that you never thought you would go. You're around people you never thought you'd be around. You're wishing you'd never have gone here. You missed a sign way back, 12 miles back, and now you are stuck in Simpsonville. But there is good news for you. Can I just tell you, the empty tomb is a sign for you, telling you, turn around. Turn around. Even if you're in a place that you thought you would never go, and even if you feel the brokenness and the weight all around you, and even though you feel like you've missed out on years of your life, even though you feel like you are lost, turn around. There was a sign 12 miles back. You missed it, but that's okay. You can turn around right now from right where you are and start to pursue God's design. Some of you are drifting, and you've been drifting for years, and you are so far from God's design, but God is saying the empty tomb is a sign for you. Come on back. Turn around. I've got a place for you. I've got a seat at the table for you. Come on back. Number two, new life is available for you. 
new life is available for you. When I was about 30 years old, I entered into a rigorous doctoral program. And before they let me in, I had to apply, I had to interview, I even had to take several courses over again from my master's degree. They called it leveling work. I called it, you know, I probably did really bad the first go round. <laughs> they finally let me into the program. After all of the preliminary work, I, I get in, and it was an intense program. Lots of reading, heavy coursework, difficult assignments, a challenging program. And then I'll never forget, I get to my very first doctoral cohort, and I did what every man does. I started looking around, and I'm sizing up the other members of this class. And I'm just starting to think, I don't belong here. These people are smarter than me. And I start, I start labeling, okay, this guy's an egghead. This guy's a brainiac. This guy's literally a genius. And I start thinking, I, I, I don't belong here. I barely graduated from Mulberry High School. I'm the only person in my family to have a college degree. What am I doing? I do not belong here. And then I'll never forget the professor, he stands up and he says, some of you feel like you don't belong here. And I thought, he knows. <laughs> you know how some of you feel on Sunday morning and you come and you tell me, pastor, did my wife call you? <laughs> Your wife didn't call me. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. He says, some of you feel like imposters, but let me just remind you of something. You have applied to this program. You have interviewed. You've done leveling work. You are here, not because you believe in you, but because we believe in you. We believe some things about you. You're not here by accident. This is God's plan for you to be in this program. So even though it feels like you have imposter syndrome, you're not an imposter. God wanted you here. I would say the same to all of you. There's some of you who are in a room like this and you look around and you just start sizing people up thinking, oh man, these people are like super Christians. These are like SEAL Team 6 Christians around here. These people carry their own Bible. They memorize scripture. They even like give. When that bucket goes by, they gave money. I mean, these are like real, genuine Christians. God, I just feel like such an imposter. You're not. You're not. Can I just remind you that the God who brought you to life, the God who wants to redeem you, by the precious blood of his son, that God, he loves you. And he does not have you here by accident. You are here on purpose. He loves you. You might feel like an imposter, but God has you right where he wants you for this message. You see, the empty tomb, it, it's a sign that's inviting you in to new life. He wants to give you new life. That's why John said in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's anyone. It doesn't matter how long you've been in Simpsonville. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter where you were last night. It doesn't matter your background, your socioeconomic background, gay, straight, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. God is calling you to follow him. He wants you to have new life in him. If you'll just look to the sign that he's already provided, the empty tomb, if you'll just receive new life by faith in Christ, you can have eternal life. You can have a new life. You can leave Simpsonville in the past and start chasing God from here. That's what God wants for you. In fact, all of this was written in the book of John for that reason. That's why in John eleven twenty six 26, it says, everyone who believes in me shall never die. New life. At the end of his book, in John chapter 20, John tells us the purpose for his writing is, is you. He says this, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name new life. That's what God wants for you. Some of you've come in today and you need new life. This old life is dragging you down. It's wearing you out. You need new life. So the empty tomb is a sign for you. New life is available for you. Number three, believing is up to you. Believing is up to you. No one can choose for you. Oh, oh I wish I could. I wish I could choose for you, but I can't. Only you can choose. I remember when I was a boy, uh, we played board games a lot, and I always loved to play checkers. And there's this marvelous feeling that happens when one of your checkers 
actually navigates the board and gets to the other side of the board, and you get to say those wonderful words, king me. And my brother had to take one of those checkers that he stole from me, and he flips it over, and there's a crown on the back side of that checker. And then my checker that has just become a king, it can go anywhere it wants on that board. It can go up, down, diagonal. It's amazing. All because he's the king. You know why? Because the king goes wherever he wants. When Jesus becomes the Lord of your life, it's a way of you saying, Lord, I'm making you the king. And you can go anywhere you want throughout my life. You can wander into my relationships. You can wander into the workplace. You can wander into my children's lives. You can wander anywhere because you're the king. I'm allowing you to have free reign. This means I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll say anything. I'll give anything. My life is in your hands because you are the king. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, he was establishing his kingship. And the same way that he rode into Jerusalem, he wants to ride into your life today. And when he rides into your life, he's not just there to be an addendum. He's not just there to be a footnote in your life. He's there because he's saying, hey, 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 king me. King me. I want to be the Lord of your life. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, there's only one of two choices. You're either going to have to cross me or you're going to have to king me. You're either going to have to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, or crucify, crucify. Which one are you going to choose? I hope you say, king me. Come into my life, Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. You can take over. You have permission to do anything you want in my life because you are the king. You have lordship. I've been trying to do it my own way, and I've messed it up. I want you to come in and be the Lord of my life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And on this Palm Sunday, have you ever told Jesus, Lord, you get the right to declare kingship in my life. I want you to come in. I surrender to you. My relationships, my finances, my workplace, God, it's all yours. Because if he's not the king, he's nothing. You're not here by accident. Your very presence today is a sign that God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. He's crazy for you. And he loves you so much that he made all the conditions right for you to be here today. Think about it. Of all the places you could be right now, he has you here in church on a Sunday morning. God has you here. You don't have to feel like an imposter. He wanted you here. He has you here on purpose. People are constantly looking at all the wrong signs. They want God to write it in the sky, make it appear on the shore. But God already gave you the greatest sign you could ever receive. It's the empty tomb 2,000 years ago. God sent his one and only son to be crucified on a cross for you, to be raised from the dead, not just for the sins of the whole world, for your sin, because he loves you personally, by name. He loves you. And right now, he wants you to receive him by faith. Some of you are here today and you feel like imposters. Hey, before we go today, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if some of you are here today and you say, I need the Lord to save me, would you just raise your hand? Just lift up your hand. I need salvation. I need Jesus to save me. Just lift up your hand wherever you are. I see lots of hands all over the place. If your hand is up and you are reaching out to the Lord, he will reach back. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're reaching out, maybe pray this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I feel like an imposter. But you've got me here today. And so I'm choosing to believe. I believe that you were crucified on a cross for me and that you were raised from the dead. Come into my life. Make me clean. I want to live for you. Lord Jesus, right now, I'm choosing to believe in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.